Hello, welcome to the nation. I'm Nadia Abdullatif. Humankind is fast growing in numbers and in age. Now, by 2030, there will be 8 billion of us and 1 billion over the age of 65. With the advancement of medicine and technology, humankind has been able to live longer, but not necessarily better. The issues of inequity, quality of life, healthcare, well-being continue to be challenges that we struggle with. And Malaysia is no exception to the rule. Now, up till 2020, more than 7% of the Malaysian population are above 65, making the country what we call an aging nation. Of course, this leads to several other concerns from what policies should be in place, what services should be right, and what efforts should be underway to ensure that Keluarga Malaysia, as we know it, is truly inclusive for all. Now, today I have the pleasure of speaking to Delrin Douglas, President of Age Cope Malaysia, and Mohan Manthiri, Editor-in-Chief, Informed Informat Magazine, as we discuss elderly care in Malaysia. Welcome and thank you for joining me today, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nadia. Good afternoon. Now, let's jump straight into it. Delrin, I'll focus on you first. 2056 is the number that Malaysia has been given and is projected to not only be an aging nation, but super aged, right? So what does this actually mean and what do we need to do? Uh, super age in 2056, aged nation by year 2030. It means that the current senior citizens that we have in our country today, one at, uh, estimated 1.5 million, by the year 2030 will be 4.5 million of our total population, meaning it's a triple the figures today. And by 2056, it will mean that more than 30% of our country's citizens will be uh, aged, will be senior citizens. That means one in every three person by the year 2056 would be an elderly senior citizen. So uh, it means that we, we are not ready currently to, to embrace that there will be more senior citizens in the times to come. Well, okay, I'm going to start out by playing devil's advocate. A lot of people are now talking about, well, I mean, age is just a number, right? Even if you're above 65, a lot of people are still contributing. A lot of people are still very healthy. But Mohan, what does this actually mean? I mean, yes, age is perhaps just a number, but it comes with it a lot of other considerations. So building on what Delrin said, what are your thoughts? Uh, very true, Nadia. Yes, age is a number, uh, both physically and mentally. And we can see that we have a lot of living examples. Um, uh, studies shows, for example, the, uh, the blue uh, cube study showed that how people can easily live up to 100 uh, comfortably. Because I think the main concern when you age is your health. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as we know, uh, once you're above 55, 60, that's when you start using a lot of healthcare. You need a yes. lot of help. Um, now, uh, in Malaysia, for example, uh, the National Health and Mobility Survey, which was done in 2018 on elderly health findings, close uh, shows very clearly that 31.9% of those above 60 reportedly have low support in terms of social interaction and satisfaction, mm. and almost 43% faced limitations in activities of daily living. That means shopping, food preparation, domestic care, medication, transportation. So the challenge is with the aging population is the care that they require, mm. especially if we don't age you know, gracefully, and age healthily, you know. So this is where the, the real challenge is. The, the resource consumption for healthcare is going to be enormous. Enormous, definitely. And last year, I had a conversation with both EPF um, and Bursa, and in their conversation and in their study, they've noticed that, you know, it's quite common for income uh, countries, middle-income countries like us, to be having individuals that live up to about 19 years post-retirement but mm -hmm. in Malaysia, the study shows that only one of that total number of years is actually spent in good health. So what you mentioned, Mohan, was a real aha, right? Because what happens after, it's not about the years to the life, but the quality in the years that you have. Now, both yes. of you have been having multiple years of experience, both in government, civil service, and now, you know, charting new territories on your own and in corporate. Can you share with me, especially for Malaysia, what's been doing 
what we've been doing well and what we're not doing well at all. Um, can I start, Mr. Mohan? Yes, please. Yes. Continue. Uh, uh, what we are doing well is that we have enough studies, we have enough researchers who have conducted so much studies and we know that we are heading to be an aged population and we know we are not ready. Uh, that we are doing very well. Yeah, okay. we, we are number one in that. All the research shows that. What we are not ready, not doing well are that the, the government agencies are not in sync with one another. Uh, meaning one ministry is aware, the other ministry uh, not aware and they, 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 they're not passing the message to one another that uh, this must be done. We are heading towards an aged population. I will give an example. The Lembaga Penduduk Malaysia, they, they have conducted research and studies that we are heading to, to be a super aged nation. But under the local authorities, they, they are not prepared to make uh, the, the places, the landscape all uh, uh, user friendly for the senior citizens. Everything is not ready. We are not ready for the population. And even you know that uh, a lot of aged population will need nursing care, health care, because most children nowadays are working they can't they can't take care of their parents or their family at home or mm -hmm. during back with my grandparents time we have 12 children they had 12 children someone would be able to take care of the machi were able to take care of the parents but nowadays we have only two or three kids and most of the female partners of the family are also working so yes. there is no doubt they, there is a need for nursing care but the local authorities are, are, are not aware that we need so many nursing cares and they are putting red tapes, hindrance to get license. So on one part, agencies are aware. On another part, agencies are are like oblivious to the to the to the impending uh, problems that we may face if we don't get ready from today. Okay, I love that. I hear several things. You mentioned data. That's a really good thing. We've done really well, and I think we should continue doing that. Right, with data, we get you know uh, more of the services that are needed. Uh, well, directed to the kind of beneficiaries and stakeholders that we need, or what we call in Bahasa, uh, sampai ke sasaran, eh, kumpulan sasaran, right? Yes. But what we're talking about here is we also have an issue in silos. We're also talking about infrastructure. Uh, we also have issues in bureaucracy. Mohan, what about you? What are your thoughts? What are we doing well and what are we doing wow. not so well? Uh, thank you, Darren. I think he is, uh, brought up a very important, very uh, urgent uh, need because uh we have been talking about this for many years already how malaysia is aging in fact we are aging so much faster in fact one of the uh, fastest rate of aging in the world actually the mm. japanese took 100 years to age we are taking doing the same thing in less than 30 years so yes so they had the the time to prepare for the aging population we don't have that right currently uh we are i would say we are very unprepared the whole aging industry is uh, geared by the private sector. Uh, mm. And this is where, like what uh, Darren pointed out, we need coordination, we need facilitation from the authorities to make sure that at least these private facilities can survive and can do well to support the need because the need is tremendous now with this aging population. And in Malaysia, uh, we have uh, issues which probably is very unique compared to other countries, we have what we call the empty nest syndrome, where yes. the aging population can afford because their children are paying for it, but they are not here in Malaysia to take care of them. They are overseas, but we need good facilities to cater to these kind of needs. Uh, so that's uh, a very, very uh, important uh, point which we need to address immediately. And in that process, of course, we need to look at the resources not every, not all Malaysians can afford the kind of services we intend to provide. Uh, so how do we, the majority may not be able to, and they also need this sort of help. And especially with urbanization, now Malaysia, 80% of the population is in the urban cities. Yes. So majority, and, and there's a lot of other social uh, uh, issues that have come up with this uh, migration to the urban uh, environment. The elderly people, are they able to, be taken care of the the youngsters are very busy with the with the challenges we face now you know so i think uh, uh, we should stop talking and we should see more action implementation i like that 
And just uh, for a bit of a trivia, right, Mohan, because you said that Japan took much longer. I think France took over 100 years. They took about 115 years. Yes. Uh, Sweden took 85 years. United Kingdom took 45 years. We sped up the process. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, there were several things that you mentioned, right? You were also talking about a rising cost of living. You were talking about the empty nest syndrome, talking about the strain. Uh, in your views, right, one of the things sp specific to retiring, trying to find new meaning for life, uh, and then, of course, understanding the rising cost of healthcare that you might not anticipate uh, before reaching retirement or old age. What are some of the things that we can have other than, for example, financial aid that is being provided for by the government? Because to your point, Mohan and Delrin, there's a lot more things that are needed, not just in terms of aid, uh, but in terms of how would we manage the rising cost of healthcare specifically for our senior citizens or our pioneer citizen group uh, for Malaysia better? Um, uh, uh, me, sorry, uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, Mr. Moore, you go ahead first. No, no, go ahead there. It's fine. Um, we, we do not have a, an actual uh, system for our country yet. Uh, we do not mm -hmm. have. Uh, whereby, like in certain Western countries, the government will will, uh, will jump in and uh, to take care of their senior citizens. Uh, possibly because the income tax rate, their rates are higher, and mm. and and we, they may have some sort of insurance scheme, whereby they start putting in from young, and when they are elderly, they can tap into that insurance scheme to take care of them when they are elderly. But in Malaysia, mm. we are not prepared for that, and. Looking at statistics and data that we have so much, we know that many of our, our senior citizens have to find uh, jobs, odd jobs again, to take care of themselves. And mm. when you talk about the urban nest syndrome, it doesn't even happen for Malaysians who go overseas. Even those who migrate to urban cities and left their parents in the in the kampongs or villages, they too have to work. And you you will see uh, elderly working until seventy years old, eighty years old because. They cannot support with the current level of uh, uh, income. And if they were to encounter any health problems, and Malaysia has a high diabetic rate, we have yes. high, we have all these kind of sicknesses. And when they are struck with this kind of uh, illness, uh, that's where it becomes, they immediately, even if they are M40 group, they immediately fall into the B40 group yes. super fast. Yes. Yeah, so we are not ready. Uh, honestly, sadly, we are not ready for that. Um, Mohan, what are your thoughts? Um, see, what's happening uh, here, like what Darren said, we don't have a financing scheme like other countries. If you look at Australia or the developed countries, they have a finance scheme where when you age, there is good support from the, uh, the scheme, the government itself. Uh, for example, if you look at other countries, like 40, 50 years ago in US and uh, Europe, uh, nursing home is something very common. That was how uh, aged care was managed. Now they are moving away from nursing homes to more independent care. They mm -hmm. encourage them to be independent in their own homes as long as possible. Unless they become very dependent, then they are moved to a nursing facility. But to do that, we need to have the kind of support, both social, healthcare support, uh, and the financing to provide that. Uh, for me, I personally believe that Malaysia has the kind of uh, infrastructure at the moment. Uh, for example, the kind of uh, clinics, we are well spread, we have very good GP practices and all that. What we need to do is develop systems affordable for the uh, yeah. majority of the population, uh, uh, see how we can bring care closer to home or towards the home. This was the mission Minister of Health many years ago and still is, how to bring care closer to home or to homes. And I believe the current infrastructure uh, can be utilised to provide that kind of uh, care. So in that sense, we will be able to better take care of our senior citizens in their own homes. Uh, but we also need to put in place certain training programs for geriatric care for mm -hmm. our professionals in the in the public uh, sector and also provide training for, as caregivers for the family members so that they would know how to manage uh, their own parents who would need certain type of uh, health care at the aging you know when they age 
Mohan, I wanted to kind of deep dive a little on that. Has COVID-19 changed any of this? If you notice with digital technology, we've got a lot more telehealth, we've got a lot more mm -hmm. ways in which people can uh, receive and reach out for help. Because to your point, you said that care for the elderly is not just in homes. It can exist in your own very own family homes. And there are many different ways of doing this, including mm -hmm. enabling the support or the caregivers that are going to be now caregiving for uh, the loved one who is elderly in a better way, right? Um, we've seen, obviously, an increase in depression, uh, depletion in personal savings. You're talking about um, the need for better connectivity and innovative financing for the elderly, especially coming out of COVID. What are some of the things that can be lessons learned that we've managed to adapt somehow and we can actually take lessons learned from this moving forward? Yes, true. Very true. Actually, COVID has uh, there are a positive side to what uh, you know, the outcome from COVID. For example, like uh, I'm involved uh, in providing home care for the last four years. Uh, we sent out our nurses and caregivers to the homes to care for the senior citizens. Um, we realized that during this uh, period, COVID, uh, the last two years, the demand for such services have tremendously increased. Because one is because the, you don't want to bring them to the hospitals because mm -hmm. it's very highly infectious. Secondly, the hospital's beds were full with COVID patients. Uh, so what happens to the senior citizens who need care in, in, their, in the homes? So this is where you know, care is delivered by our caregivers and nurses who are trained to provide such care, uh, which becomes much more affordable and also uh, it becomes much safer rather than going into a, a facility where infections can be very high and there's no need for that because i think if you have a very good system uh, in place a uh, lot of these care healthcare services can be delivered at home and this this what happening uh, in so covid has shown us that that's the way to go telemedicine has become very popular so we do a lot of teleconsultation you don't need very big systems your mobile phone is very good enough to do a good teleconsultation uh, with the doctors and the nurses. The video uh, and everything, right? Yeah. Videos, yeah. Ph uh, pharmacy, medicine is delivered uh, to the home. We send physiotherapies. Doctors visit homes. So a lot of things actually can be managed at home. So this is the positive outcome, I believe, uh, from this uh, COVID pandemic. Thanks, Mohan. And I know that you know we're fast reaching the end of this, but I wanted to also jump into what uh, Delrin had earlier mentioned prior to the start of this conversation, that his place has a setup for Zoom and computers and what have you, so that allows for uh, uh, residents to be able to connect back with family. Now, one of the things that I noticed for elderly care in Malaysia is really loneliness, the issue of mental health, the, uh, you know, the issues of psychologically being able to connect with others. You know, we are communal beings. So Delrin, in your efforts, what have you done to be able to address some of these issues? It's not just about, you know, the physical health, right? Yeah. Irrespective of uh, COVID and the lockdowns, uh, what, what our centre has done is we have more games. We had more mm -hmm. games, more colouring. Uh, we set up a, a singing session amongst the elderly, uh, which is was less, uh, it's a learning process for me too. It was lesser before prior to COVID because the family members can visit them. But when we were locked down uh, together with, with the residents, we had more activities among ourselves. Uh, yeah. So that, that one was a, a, a way to get rid of the boredom of uh, being alone. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the fact that culturally in Malaysia, we've got this, I think it's a bit of a jaundiced view about elderly care and it's also our own blind spot, right? We tend to think that elderly care equals nursing homes, equal really sad, alone, um, you know, parents who have no family members who want to care for them, which is not necessarily true, right? And Mohan, you mentioned this right from the start. In other countries, people look forward to going to retirement homes or retirement village, where they call it that. And, you know, you meet friends. And I've even seen with my own eyes in Sabah where they found love for the first time. And, you know, it's it's really something enriching. Mm -hmm. What are some of the stigmas that are still there, you know, uh, jaundiced perceptions about nursing care or nursing homes in Malaysia? And what can we do about that? Uh, very true. I think... Uh... I visited uh, nursing homes in the US when I was there almost 25 years back. And at that time itself, I saw how 
well established they were and how comfortable it was you know staying in a nursing home with the heterogeneous uh, population in malaysia i believe we are moving towards that a lot of our in the from the private sector a lot of developers are embarking on projects yes. towards that which is very good now, right yes uh, but the question again is how many malaysians can afford it you know exactly. uh, affordability becomes a really a big issue but saying that i think uh, currently what we have in malaysia uh, especially during covid um, you see when when you grow old uh, other than healthcare you need social interaction which is very important uh, which is seriously lacking in our homes at the moment uh, because we can't allow the families to visit we can't mm-hmm. allow friends to visit so like what darren said we have to manage them with our staff our caregivers and nurses so we have parties every birthday is a party every occasion you know create and a lot of games a lot of activities daily activities uh is quite a challenge actually to keeping them engaged in you know to keeping them happy because i think that's very important the social part of the whole thing rather than mm-hmm. just taking up their physical health and i believe uh, um hopefully very soon in the next 4 to 5 years we will see more facilities in malaysia that will be catering to the kind of uh, uh, services we all anticipate when we retire uh, oh, nice can i you. come in yeah. yes please this is in 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 regards to what uh, mr mohan said in order to have more facilities i would like uh, if the ministers current ministers now can engage us uh, operators especially hco uh, to and uh, how do we enhance our centers nationwide because you maybe mentioned people think it's gloomy people think it's uh, uh, not the place to go uh, one of the reason why uh, this could happen is because uh, government themselves have estimated out of the 1700 centers nationwide only 382 are li- licensed yeah. that means a lot of them are not licensed when yes. but when you have unlicensed centers you're going to again get people who are going to uh, undercut uh, Uh, just do things that is not in line and then the government don't know where they are and how are you going to upgrade them when you don't yeah. even license them but yeah. maybe the agencies need to sit down together uh find ways to license all these centers without incurring too much cost you know where they are find ways to upgrade them we will work together with you ishko mr mohan the informat and many of us in the industry are willing to work with the government it's just yeah. that when we approach the government they are they, they are yet to 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 get back to us and we we love to if the government can work hand in hand get us prepared you have the data we we are experienced on the ground and we yeah. can work together to make malaysia better yeah so i, I, I do, definitely agree with yeah. that um, yeah and, and okay, sorry go ahead go ahead go proceed proceed yeah, and i hope the agencies can sit down too and get everything in sync uh, because now we are totally everywhere all over the place I love that you said that because I was just going to say the same thing. Okay, now one last question before we have to wrap up. Now all of us are aging. What are some of the things that we can do ourselves as individuals to prepare ourselves better? And we've learned from the whole COVID exercise that majority of people have either depleted their savings or now they're in dire straits. They're living longer, not necessarily healthier. But listening to this today, if anyone's watching this, what can we do for ourselves to make sure that we age well as as well? I'll uh, go first. This okay, is very much uh, why I'm uh, publishing Informat. The main issue is we need to get everyone to take charge of their health. You yes. need to be responsible for your health. That means you need to know everything about yourself. How is your glucose? How is your pressure? Are you managing it? You need to change according to your lifestyle so that you manage it well. You age gracefully and you live healthily. It's no use. We age at the age of sixty-five, seventy, and we are totally dependent. Yes. Not only it becomes very expensive, life has no meaningful. So I believe uh, all of us have to start taking charge of our health. Love it, Delvin. What about you? Uh, exercise more when you're young. Don't wait until you are pensioner to exercise. One, uh, <laughs> exercise from young. Number two, uh, get your health checked annually because some yes. people. Uh, they don't even know that their cholesterol is high. They don't even know their their glucose level is high. Do an annual check. We even have in- income tax rebate for your health check. Yet not many people are doing the annual health check. Uh, mm. Third, 
don't overspend. Keep some for a rainy day. So these three mm -hmm. advice, exercise, do a health check, and keep some for a rainy day is my advice to all people, irrespective of age, because it starts awesome. from young. Definitely. Yeah. I, I love that. Now, you've said so many different things. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I think we're going to have to ask the producers if we can have another session with you because I think we've only just sort of scratched the surface of the kind of issues yes. that we're facing. Um, of course, I hear you. You're talking about we really have lots of things that are going well, but we need a better system. We need to stop being bureaucratic. We need to work together. We need to break those silos, work on licensing. We have the data. So let's mm -hmm. culminate that together so we can put metal to the pedal, action on the ground, and really do what is needed. We need to have better stakeholder engagement. The government may have their ideas, but we have a lot of operators that are experienced on the ground who might be able to do and share what they think would be a good idea or things that can be done for the masses. And they are ever willing to work together with the government uh, to create a better Keluarga Malaysia. You also talked yes. about the current ministers, um, and I think this ties back to the CSO, NGO, government, corporate, working together. And yes, to your point, Mohan, we can have more property development, building uh, sort of retirement concept townships, mm -hmm. but we also have to think about the affordability for the masses, especially mm -hmm. coming out of COVID. Now, everything that you've said to me kind of sums it up to, again, the issue that we've had before. Where there are services, is it available? Is it accessible? Is it affordable? And then the next challenge is, can we make it sustainable? It's not just great to just launch something fantastic. We also need right. to find ways in which this is sustainable for us. Now, talking about mm -hmm. sustainability, you wrapped it up by saying, for our own selves, we need to start understanding ourselves. Health literacy is key. Not just awareness, but literacy about what you yes. need. Um, we we're talking about exercising from young, being mindful about what you put into your body, not neglecting your annual health checks, and of course, saving for a rainy day because we all want to age gracefully. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today um, from all of us in Bernama. Please stay safe, stay well, and let's age gracefully. I'm Nadia Blatif. Have a good day. Thank you.